Welcome to Restoration Church, located in Goleta, California. To learn more about us, please visit r-church.org. To watch our service or join us via live stream, check out our YouTube channel by searching Restoration Church Goleta. We are in a series, um, we're starting a series today called Joy in Context. Um, And so it's a letter to the church. Now, why joy in context? Now, today is the prequel to the epistle of Paul to the church in Philippi, um, known by uh, many as the epistle of Philippians or the book of Philippians. So why joy in context? Well, the book of Philippians is known as the book of joy. Interestingly enough, though, the word joy is only in it five times. The word rejoice, however, is in it multiple times. And what you see is an overall general vibe of the Apostle Paul writing to a church that's pretty healthy. And he's, for, in today's terms, he's stoked with who they are and who they're becoming. Um, and it's so, but why joy in context? Well, there is a context about this letter that I think will help us have true biblical joy. To help us really define what it looks like and maybe reprioritize some of our priorities and what we find joy in. And so that will be something that we'll be exploring throughout that time. More on that next week. But first, the prequel. Now, memes are short, usually funny videos. Who knows what a meme is? Okay, all right. For those of you that don't, they're short, funny videos usually found on social media, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, all these different things. And there's a meme that's been going around that quotes a song by Tay Money, which I do not recommend. Okay, everybody with me? Don't listen to this song. But it says, I understood the assignment. I understood the assignment. Yeah, I, I just quoted that. You're welcome. I embarrassed my son. We're good. I've been trying to do that all week. So let me ask you this. Come back to me. What's your assignment? How'd you like that transition? (laughs) All the young people are just like. But the point is this, is do you understand your assignment? You see, here's what I mean. Is that in the body of Christ, you got saved from your sin. Amen? Like, I think most of us get that, that when we come to Christ, our sin is removed as far as the east from the west, that we are like pure as snow, like we weren't once were stained and ugly and dirty, and we carried around this this death about us. We were dead in our sin. There's none righteous, no, not one. Like, we get that part of it, and so when we were saved, we were saved from our sin, but we were saved to the church, from our sin to what's known as the body of Christ. And when we are placed into the body of Christ, also known as the church, the universal church, and then it's expressed visibly because the universal church is invisible. It's made up of all believers of all times throughout all the world. It's invisible, but it's visible within the local church. And so you are being here on a Sunday morning, a part of the body of Christ, made up, manifested visibly within the local expression of the body. So you were saved from your sin to the church for, so you have a purpose, Say from sin to the church for mutual edification, encouragement, and exhortation. And you were given a gift. Do you know that? That you are gifted by the Holy Spirit and have a unique position within the body of Christ for you to be able to not just come and receive, not just come and consume, but instead to be here within this body of church to then have a purpose. Now, I'm not here. I don't want to go too far into like what your giftings are. I want to go more of a 30,000 foot view and kind of look down into that and go, what is your purpose? And my hope is to, to encourage you, to exhort you, to edify you and say the most important thing is to prioritize the kingdom of God in your life. No matter what your gift is. 
So some of us have the gift of teaching and preaching. Some of us have the gift of administration. Some of us have the gift of prophetic. Some of us have the gift of tongues in a prayer life. Some of us have the gift of intercession. There's all these different gifts within the body of Christ. No matter what that gifting is, and that's for you, and if you're like, hey, I don't know, pastor, come and talk to me. Let's talk about what it looks like to receive, and maybe you don't even know this. In fact, you know what I'm going to do? Let's pray. Let's pray right now. You guys ready? Father, we pray in Jesus' name and the power of your Holy Spirit, the Spirit, you would come and gift, and that you would reveal your gifting to your saints, to your people, the people that call upon your name to be saved. You have promised that based on their belief, you have sealed them with the promised Holy Spirit, God, and they have an inheritance, but before they go and receive that inheritance, they have been gifted by your power to edify, encourage, and exhort the body of Christ. Lord, would you anoint, fill, immerse your people with the Holy Spirit. And that you would gift. That you would gift your people, Lord God. And the gifts that, would you reveal what that gifting is right now in Jesus' name. Whatever it is, Lord God, would you reveal it. Now, Help us, Lord, use that gift to seek your kingdom, to prioritize your kingdom, to be used for your kingdom, that we would have a kingdom-first mindset. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. What's your assignment? So your gifts will vary, but when our gifts are used for the kingdom of God, it always works out. Did you know that? That when we use our gifts for the glory of God, for the kingdom of God, everything tends to work itself out. Now, not always how we think or how we imagine or how we hoped, but at the end of the day, we will have all of our needs met. We will get exactly what we need, and it will work out for the good. Jesus says it this way. But seek first, what's it say? The kingdom of God. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And he's in context of all the things that we worry about and have anxiousness about. Will I be able to pay my bills? Will I be able to afford clothes and food? And let's face it, we're not in that spot where we're like, I don't know where my next meal is going to come from. And so, so we still have the ability, though, to seek first the kingdom of God. And then it says in Romans 8, 28, a highly quoted verse. And we know that all things, or we know that for those who love God, in other words, verse John would say, how do we know we love God? By obeying his commands. It's an outward expression, a response to the greatness of the gospel of Jesus. You guys still with me? Am I talking too fast? So, okay, I'll, I'll slow it down a little bit. In response to the greatness of the gospel, we are called then to, as we've talked about previously, to put aside, to put to death, to lay aside the sin that so easily entangles us and to put on godly qualities and characters. And that's walking in obedience to the kingdom of God. When the kingdom of God is first and we know that we love God, not only with our lips, but with our heart, and the way that it's expressed itself in our life. Now are you guys with me? It says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. You see, you have a purpose. You have an assignment. And you are called to live into that. Now the Apostle Paul is a great example of such living. He has a kingdom-first mindset. And even when things don't seemingly work work out, they they 
actually go pretty bad at times. In the bigger picture, they do work out. And what I hope is, is that you can see that it's the same God that you serve, that the Apostle Paul served. And as we keep the kingdom of God mindset first, if we seek first the kingdom of God, then we can know, believe, and understand that it may not work out right now in the valley, but we know for sure it's going to work out in the big picture. Not because of you, but because of our God. Is that an amen? Amen. Now, we see the Apostle Paul. He begins his ministry, really. He's been ministering for a while at this point. But we see a culmination of where his ministry starts in the book, um, in uh, I think it's Acts 13, where him and Barnabas are in Antioch. Uh, I could be a little off on the chapters, but nevertheless, he starts in Antioch where they're, they're, they're praying like we were on Friday night. We were there praying and seeking Jesus. And then prophetically, they sent Paul and Barnabas, lay hands on them like we laid hands on Diane on Friday, laid hands on them, and they sent them out to be missionaries, to go and share the good news of the gospel. And so they went out, and then all they would do is they'd go into a city, they would find the local synagogue, they would preach Jesus. Oftentimes, some would get saved, but most of the time, the synagogue would reject the message. Then they'd go out to the Gentiles and non-Jewish people, and then preach the gospel. Then a remnant would get saved. They would then leave that city with follow-up. Oftentimes, leave another pastor there to train up another pastor, to find faithful men who will then find others discipleship, great commission, and then a church would be planted. And we see this all throughout all the epistles for the most part. Most of the epistles are, well, actually all of them are to the church. Some of them are to the church generally, but a lot of them are like the church, like First and Second Corinthians was written to the church in, any guesses? Corinth, exactly. Like the, the book of Galatians. Anybody know the t- name of the town that the church was at? Galatia. And so these are local churches that were planted by the Apostle Paul for the most part. And if it wasn't Paul directly, like in Colossians, it was a someone that he told the message and then they went and shared the message and planted another church. And so we see that Paul and Barnabas are called to church plant. They go out on their first missionary trip, establish a church in certain cities, and then follow up. Churches are planted. And what's crazy is, side note, This church is here because of those efforts. Isn't that crazy? That Paul planted and then sent out, and then him and Barnabas split over this guy named Mark, and Barnabas takes Mark, and then Paul takes uh, Timothy and Silas, and they go, and they end up making up towards the end. That's not the point of the story, but then they end up splitting, and there's persecution in the church in Jerusalem, and then those in Jerusalem go out and start spreading the message, like Philip with the Ethiopian, and we see the message spreading and spreading and spreading, and then the gospel message begins to kind of like a like a cool map that starts to get just like change colors. It just kind of comes across. And then we see the the church planting efforts when we come to America. And then from the Southern Baptist Association and their efforts to plant churches in the Americas, in 1873, a few families gathered together in Hill Ranch, which is this hill right over here, and said, hey, we're going to start a church. And then in 1875, they established this church with the Southern Baptist Association, and they planted this church. And you can trace it all the way back to Paul and Barnabas and Antioch. Can you imagine? Who else wants to add that kind of legacy? Yeah, one of you. Thank you. (laughs) Okay, we've got two. I don't think that Paul imagined. Maybe he did. Maybe he saw it because he got to go into the heavenlies. But I don't think he imagined that his efforts, his small walking into a town, few people would get saved, would turn into an actual revolution of church planting. And here's the key is that Paul is just a normal dude like you and I. But he's gifted and empowered with not a normal God. 
And I think sometimes the only distinction between you and the Apostle Paul is the Apostle Paul had a kingdom first mindset. And the challenge, the encouragement is, will you today take on a kingdom first mindset? To be able to go, yes, I want God's kingdom first. Yes, God. So Paul and Barnabas split up over Mark, as I said. They take, Paul takes Timothy and Silas on a second missionary journey, and they had a plan. So Acts 16, starting in verse 6. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And so what's going on is they had a plan, Phrygia and Galatia. They're on their way. They're going to go preach there, follow up there, continue to plant churches in that area. But they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And it goes on, verse 7, when they come up to... um, um, Messiah, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. And so you have the Holy Spirit and Jesus kind of going, hey, you can't go here. Verse 8, so passing by Messiah, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. There's a really good chance that Luke was with him as well, because we see the terminology is Luke wrote the um, gospel of Luke and Acts. He starts to use the personal pronoun we. And so now you have these men going there to preach the gospel in Macedonia. Well, Macedonia is where the town of Philippi was located. And so what's interesting, though, is I want to point out is that they had a kingdom first mindset. How many of you have thought, okay, this is what I'm going to do, and then that didn't work out? Real simple, right? Do you know, believe, and understand that even though that didn't work it out, as we as Christians love God, that God is working that out? Even now? Like in this moment? Because I think some of us might easily fall into despair. Fall into, why God? Why didn't this work itself out? Why didn't, and then you fill in the blank. Whatever that expectation is that has led to your current faith frustration. Just looking out into the crowd, I know that there's those out there. They're just like, God, why hasn't this happened yet? Well, look at the example of the Apostle Paul. I don't go too far as we exposit this text, but I think in other biblical areas we can see, like in Romans 8, 28, that oftentimes we will go out, we think we're going to do something. Well, as Proverbs would say, a man's heart leads the way, but the Lord directs his steps. And we can know and believe that as we have a kingdom first mindset, that even though the door might get shut, saints, the door's gonna, another door's gonna open. That even though this current door might get shut, another door will open. And what is our call within this? To have a kingdom first mindset, to be about God's kingdom, to be about, okay, so what does it mean to be about God's kingdom? Think about that question for a second. Is it not to prioritize God in your personal life, in your personal devotions, in your prayers? Because our minds, are they not prone to wander? Are they not prone to drift? So that means that there's going to be a priority in the things that we put into our minds. Because if you just allow your mind right now to do what, it's, what it wants, is it going to show up at 7 a.m. prayer? <laughs> See, there's, there's something about a, an intentionality, a certain mindset that causes a discipline. That instead of just, as I've talked about before, kind of walking in surrender. God, if you want me to... Let me go to 7 a.m. prayer. I'm just using that as an example. And, and you don't set your alarm. 
and you have, make no other plans to get there. Now we're back to that story of the guy drowning on the roof. You guys remember that story? God, save me, and he sends a boat, and uh, sends a paddle boat, a motor boat, and a helicopter, and he ends up dying, for those of you who didn't hear the story. And God, he's like, God, why didn't you save me? He's like, bro, I sent you two boats and a helicopter. All you had to do was step. To step. And we live in this idea of surrender, but instead, like, pray like the Psalms. When you read the Psalms, I want you to start underlining, underlining every time the author of the Psalms, whether it be David or somebody else, I will, that term, I will, I will praise you, I will serve you, I will worship you. Like, where's those prayers? Like, where's the guy that prays like that? Because it's within God's truth, according to his word, and then we pray in such a way to where it's not just like, Lord, if you be your will, I'm just like, kind of surrender. That, I mean, I get that. Jesus prays that. But I think we use that kind of surrender as an excuse to be able to do anything. And we don't use the redeemed will that God has given us to step in. I will go to 7 a.m. prayer. Everybody say that with me. I'm just kidding. But like, that's the, like, I will. You will what? Fill in the gap. You will what? What does it look like for you? Melissa, are you okay? Uh, we check on her. I will what? I will read God's word more. I will pray more. How are you going to prioritize the kingdom of God? I will witness to my friends. I will, what is it in regards to, again, this is key, in response to the gospel, in response to the greatness of what Christ has done for you and through you, and he's asking you, initiate. And so that's what it looks like to have a kingdom first mindset. She good? Okay. To have a kingdom first mindset. To be able to step into this understanding of like, yeah, there's certain steps I'm going to take. You feel called to be a missionary? Go to school. Get a degree. Go on the mission field. You feel called to be a pastor? Step it up. Go to seminary. Find a way. You feel called to fill in that blank, worship more, you feel called to be more administratively sound, get some education, ask for some discipleship, and step into it. But one thing you, what isn't like keeping the kingdom of God first is just simply going, God, do something. He is doing so many things. All around you, he's waiting for you to step into them. By grace, you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, right? But then it goes on to say, for it is God, or it goes on to say, um, for you are his masterpiece. You are his workmanship. For what? For good works. That God already created beforehand for you to Walk in. Does everybody get that? Okay. <laughs> My wife's like, move on. Okay. <laughs> I think you got the point. Sometimes the Lord, and even in those pursuits of like, I want to be a missionary. I want to, like, because there's something kind of, excuse the expression, kind of sexy about being a missionary in another, another area or something along those lines, right? Like, oh, yeah, third world. I'm going to go. I'm going to serve. I'm going to do all these different things. The best way to prepare to be a missionary is to do it right here in your own city, in your own home. You don't do that, there's no way this church is going to pay for you to go be a missionary somewhere else. You be on mission here, right now, in Jesus' name, and then we'll talk. Like, that's what it looks like to prepare. Again, ready? And sometimes when we step, God's like, shuts that door. 
And then it can lead to this, like, this faith frustration. God, why didn't you let that happen? And God's like, hey, I have a bigger plan. He says it all throughout this book. It's great in case you haven't read it. He says it all throughout this book. I have a bigger plan. I have a bigger plan. Like, we don't know how. Like, you can read the commentaries on it. We don't know how the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, shut the door on Paul and the boys to go to Galatia and these, these different areas. We don't know how. It could have been through sickness. It could have been through something. But we know we get a vision on where they should go or where they're called to go. But as far as how they shut the door, we don't know. It doesn't explicitly say. And so we can assume that we don't know for sure. Like, that's how Scripture goes. But so... I can also see in other areas of scripture where God like shuts a door, but the response to that shut door is not just like, well, I'm not going then. I'm not doing anything. The response is, as Paul exemplifies, start looking for another door. Start looking for something else or another, excuse me, another way to seek first or keep the kingdom first mindset. And so they go, they get a vision, Macedonia is where they're going, so they immediately set off, verse 11. And so setting sail from uh, Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace and following uh, following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. So Philippi is this beautiful city with this massive cliff with this fantastic water. It's very, very lush and happy. And not only is this like geographically beautiful city, it also had a certain sense of um, entitlement might be the wrong word. Bottom line was is because of its location and its, its uh, some of the political the way it was used within war and stuff like that, they got what it's some Latin word, but basically they got the rights of Rome in this city. See, most of the other providences didn't have that. So as you lived in Rome and you were a Roman, you had certain rights. Philippi got those rights. It's crazy. Like if you look at it, just just based on its, its um, well, there's all kinds of history behind it. But bottom line is they had a certain amount of of uh, ability to be able to have pride in their city, to be, uh, to be a Philippian was something, because you came from a beautiful area, and you had a certain amount of like, hey, and I think it's why it's important for us as a church to go through this book, because at the end of the day, we live in a beautiful city, and we have a lot of entitlements as Americans, and I think that Paul, when he writes the book of Philippians, he begins to set some of those kind of prioritize what our joy is actually in. And again, that'll be on the coming weeks to come. And so here they are in Philippi. Now, it says at the end of verse 12, we remained in this city some days. I absolutely love this. So much like the next chapter when the Apostle Paul goes through the book of Acts, um, much like uh, as he entered into a city, oftentimes he would go and just spend time in the city. Um, and he would go and he'd, uh, what I like to call, exegete the city. Like he'd go into the city and learn what's going on in the city. Now, here's, here's my, my application to that. Before you just go and tell someone about Jesus, which I'm okay with, like, like in other words, if you just want to go stand on a soapbox somewhere and preach Jesus, Okay, by all means, if you feel called to do that, do that. But a, I see a more efficient way of getting to know people first, getting to know how to what I call a gospel bridge. So in other words, you're here, they're far from Jesus. As you get to know them personally, is there a bridge by which that can be established for you to be able to bring Jesus to them? In other words, for instance, many a times I've run into young men in the church that are looking for a Christian wife. Anyone? No, don't raise your hand if that's you. What I'm saying is, have you run into these guys, right? There's something about being a young man and being a Christian that desires to get married more so than your average young man. And so oftentimes there's just like, there's just like, I want to get married, like, right? Now, Take that, so that's not a bad desire. There's nothing wrong with that. Now take that understanding 
and apply it to a single dude who doesn't know Jesus. And they're looking for intimacy. They're looking for something. And oftentimes, like I talked about at Fields of Faith, they go down cul-de-sacs of life, hitting dead ends, trying to get fulfillment from all these other things. Bridging that gap for the young Christian man struggling as well as the unbeliever. God provides an intimacy, not in the way that you might think, but that will make you a whole person so that when you actually meet somebody, you're not trying to pull from them something they can't give, but instead you're able to be the whole you and give of yourself to that person. And whether God blesses you with a wife or not, I don't know. But here's what I do know. Seek first his kingdom, and you will be the man that you're called to be. Do you see how that's a bridge? Like, get to know somebody. Like, the Apostle Paul is constantly doing that. Goes into his city, figures out what's the idols, what's the gospel bridge, and then just starts preaching. Now, what we see in here as Paul, in his normal direct area or his direct mode of doing things, he would go to the synagogue. But interestingly enough, Philippi, because of its military strongholds um, and its, its, its major Greek setting, um, which was anti-Jewish, there wasn't even, most likely, there wasn't even a synagogue there. So there's a small remnant of Jews. And most likely he heard that these a small amount of people will go out on the Sabbath day and meet by the river and pray. So here's where we're at. So, uh, verse 13, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the woman who had come together. And one who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord, listen, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized, her and her household as well. And she urged us, saying, if you, had judged me, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And I love this. And she prevailed upon us. In other words, she was so persuasive. They're like, oh, okay. And so then they stayed. Interestingly enough, you got one convert that we know of. But she was a seller of purple goods, which gives an idea that she was rich and had lots of wealth and resources. And then her whole household gets saved and gets baptized. And then now Paul, Silas, Timothy, and possibly even Luke are hanging out in this house, teaching, discipling, showing her what was going on. Now, it's crazy that just one person, because at the end of the day, what we're going to learn the church in Philippi was one of the more generous churches in all the New Testament. When it says in Corinthians, when he's telling the Corinthians to gather an offering for Jerusalem, he talks about the church in Macedonia that's given so generously. It's talking about the church in Philippi. And so not only were they do as a church established there, but the generosity that comes from this church has a long outstretched arm that helped the churches in Jerusalem as well as Paul personally. In fact, a little heads up, one of, the reason why, one of the reasons why Paul wrote the letter to the church is because they, he, they sent one of their guys over to bring them a care package while Paul was in prison, just showing, again, the generosity. And so, in verse 16, things get crazy. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought, her, um, and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Verse 18. And she kept doing this for many days. Okay, let's just talk for a second. At first, I imagine Paul's like, Hey, that's pretty cool. Right? Because you have this girl basically possessed, but being used to the glory of God somehow. It's kind of a weird scenario. But everywhere Paul, Silas, Timothy, and maybe Luke are going, she's like, make way for the servants of God. And they're just like, hey, that's kind of cool. Like, you just walk in the room. Like, it's almost like your entourage. Like, the Apostle Paul is about to enter the room. You know, she's like calling it out, right? It might have been cool. But then we see that she keeps doing it. And so for some reason, in my mind, when I picture this, I picture the Apostle Paul. He's teaching about the gospel. And then she keeps going, these are the servants of the Most High. So anyway, 
Jesus was in like, and he goes on. These are the servants of the Most High. Finally, Paul gets irritated. Check this out. He's just like, that's enough. And so it goes on. She kept doing this, verse 18. For many days, Paul having become greatly annoyed. Right in that moment, Paul's just like, that's it. I've had enough. Turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. And so he's just like, the servants of the Most High, who she passes out, demon comes out, she's set free. Most likely she got saved, became the second convert that we know of in Philippi. But then that causes some serious problems. Look what it goes on to say. Um, but when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing the city, which is kind of funny because it's just Paul and Silas that got dragged. We don't know where Timothy is, but we know that most likely, according to scripture, he was kind of, you know, kind of frail um, at a certain point, And he was also very young. So he might have dipped during that time. He might have just been like, <laughs> But anyway, we don't know how all that worked. It's just my imagination. Forgive me for that. And so, but the bottom line is, is that Paul and Silas are dragged into these courts. So, and when they had brought them to the magistrates, verse 20, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore their garments off them and gave them orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Okay. Can we talk? When you are getting beat down, Is God's will still happening? It's an important question. When life doesn't go your way, and life seems to just hand you blow after blow after blow, is God's still God's will still being done? Think about that for a minute. Because we see in this example that the answer is yes. That Paul and Timothy, it says, it says, um, where, is it at? where does it say it here? Um, with inflicted many blows upon them with rods. That means it wasn't a slap. They got beat up. Not only got they, did they get beat up, but they were put, it says safely in prison. In other words, don't let them escape. Not safely like, like we're, we're concerned for them but safely is it don't let them escape. And so what's going on there is they're in the inner prison in shackles and they just got beat up. Picture yourself in that moment. What do you do? Because I know what they did. And what it looks like to have a kingdom first mindset, they give us this amazing example. Verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Boom. They were praising God. Seriously? They were praying and praising. They had just gotten beat up. They're in shackles. They're all bound up in prison. Not only are they praying and praising, so they're in there just hallelujah, just singing away, just singing psalms and hymns, but the other prisoners are listening to them, and so they're not only expressing their joy that they were able to suffer in the name of Jesus, but also they're being a witness. And then, check this miracle out. And suddenly, verse 26, and suddenly there was a great earthquake that, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bounds, bounds, bonds were unfastened. Can you imagine? You're there in prison. Not only you and Silas get set free. So there's this earthquake. You're like, oh man, what's going to happen? And then boom, you're, everything's like, how did that happen? My shackles are undone and the door is wide open. But they didn't run. Kingdom first mindset. And somehow, the witness of Paul and Silas, um, look at this authority. Like this has to be a God thing. Because somehow the other prisoners didn't leave either. Like if you're there and you're not a Christian, 
and all of a sudden your shackles are undone. You're looking to get beat again tomorrow until you give up this person they're asking for. Why ever you're in prison and all of a sudden you have a way of freedom. They don't go. Most likely because of the witness of Paul and Silas. And so there they are, beat up and in shackles, praising God. And we see God's will being done. Amazing. So much so, verse 27, when the jailer woke and saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. What's going on there is that if a, if a prisoner escaped under your watch, you're going to die. And so the honorable thing to do, according to the Roman rule, is to take your own life. And so in this moment, he's about to kill himself. <laughs> but verse 28, but, call, but Paul cried with a loud voice, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for the lights and rushed in and trembling with fear fell down before Paul and Silas. You see, he must have been listening to the praise. And all of a sudden, he wakes up to an earthquake, looks out, sees the door is open, goes, my life is over. Like, I am undone. He's about ready to take his own life, and he hears a, a voice. Can you imagine when he runs in, not only sees Paul and Silas, but the rest of the prisoners, unbound and free, but in there. And then he just goes, there, this must be something about these men. I, can we just pause for a minute? Paul and Silas are just like you. They're men and women just like you. We can live in this kind of power. Amen? All right, I got to wrap this thing up. I'm going way too long. So I'm having way too much fun. I don't know about you guys, but I'm having a great time. So the jailer, so the jailer called. So then in verse 30, man, this is some, one of my favorite lines. And then he brought them out and said, sir, what must I do to be saved? Ah. Verse 31, they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your whole household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized this once, he and his family. And he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. But when it was day, the magistrates sent the police saying, let those men go. Verse 36, and the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent you to let you go. Therefore, come out and go in peace. Come out now and go in peace. So the jailer comes back. He's all stoked. He's just like, hey, guess what? You guys are free. Isn't that awesome? Verse 37, but Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens. Uh-oh. And have thrown us into prison, and now do they, they throw us out secretly? No, let them come themselves and take us out. Verse 38, the police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them, hey, if it's cool with you, can you leave the city? That's how I picture anyway. Verse 40, and they, so they went out of the prison and visited Lydia, and when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. Paul, Silas, Timothy go into a city, possibly even Luke, go into a city. Lydia gets saved. Most likely, a possessed girl gets saved, a jailer in his household gets saved, and a church is planted. Paul, on his third missionary journey, follows up, visits, sends them Timothy. We know at that point a pastor, a local pastor named uh, Ep Epaphras, Ep Epaditus, I think, Ap Aphroditus, is already there. He's one of the pastors of the, the small local church. And because of the Apostle Paul kept the kingdom first mindset, all this happened in the midst of all of it. So church, let me ask you again, what's your assignment? What is your purpose? And whatever it may be, May you live with a kingdom first mindset. Amen. Thanks for listening in. If you have any questions or need prayer, send us an email at infoar-church.org. Grace and peace.